You have the betrayal of Judas, which Jesus predicts at this, last, at this Passover meal, this uh, Last Supper. Jesus predicts that one of you will betray me. And it was Judas. And what Judas did is he sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And, oh, he wasn't loyal, right? But here's probably what was in Judas' mind, what we can extract from this. He's looking at Jesus through this veil saying, he is not matching all of the law that's been prophesied about the Messiah. He is not restoring Jerusalem to a military and, and national authority over the land. He is not destroying our enemies. And then there's some like legalism weirdness where he says, you know, he is not handling the money properly. He is being too generous. He is like, there's all these elements where we interact with Judas in this way where he's not respecting the value of things. He's just throwing things away on ritual. The, the, the nard of, of the woman, like she's just wasting it. So he's putting this veil of this ideology, this legalism, and looking at Jesus through that. So he doesn't believe Jesus is who he says he is. He do, and here's the thing he doesn't believe. He doesn't believe... After he betrays Jesus, let me back up for a second. He betrays Jesus, and then after that, he is so tormented with shame and guilt, he goes back to the Sanhedrin, the ones that gave him the 30 pieces of silver, and in this, this, this seems like this grief-stricken tirade, he throws the silver back at them to try to somehow, somehow satiate this guilt feeling, somehow get rid of this shame that he betrayed Jesus. He goes back to the very ones who led him into this, this sin. And he's going to them for restoration. Contrast that with Peter. Peter was also told that you will betray me, you will deny me. Before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And Peter says, no, I won't. Turns out Peter did. And when Peter did, this is a recurring theme with Peter. But he, when he betrayed, when he denied Jesus three times, and I love how it's three times because it resonates with me because I'll know the right thing to do and not do it three times. That's real. Uh, but he, the nature of his story, later on we learn that when Jesus is resurrected and returns, there's this repentance and forgiveness and restoration. So Jesus and Peter had this relationship where Peter believed that Jesus was a God of forgiveness, was one who would forgive him and extend him grace. He did lean into what he believed about Jesus. And even though he sinned and betrayed Jesus, he was restored unto righteousness because he believed who Jesus was, that he was who he says he was. Judas didn't believe that. And it led to Judas and his facade and him doubling down on his facade and in his own guilt and shame hiding away, it led to his own suicide. That isolation, that loneliness, that guilt, if you don't believe that there is someone who will forgive you and restore you, you have nowhere to turn. And you'll turn to things that can't help you. But Peter, you see the contrast here? What's the difference? The betrayals, okay, one may be more severe than the other, but in their hearts, kind of the same. The difference is, do I believe Jesus is one that I can trust with my true self? Can I trust Jesus with the real me? And when I fail, do I go to him and ask for forgiveness? Do I express to him, like Peter, like I long to be united with you and I have offended you, I need your grace and forgiveness, and Jesus freely and fully forgives. And then now we have Peter, upon whose confession of faith we stand here today as his church, the church of Jesus. Judas is a cautionary tale. Peter is an eternal hero. Why? Because he believed Jesus is who he says he is. Why, look at the Old Testament. Why do we have stories like Jonah and Job? Look at Job. Job was tormented, right? 
this story where, where the, the devil came and, and this, is a whole, this is a whole story that is told, right? The devil came and tempted Job and took away all of his possessions to see if he was faithful to God, right? And in this temptation, Job's friends come and they start saying, Job, you must have done something wrong to make God mad for him to hurt you like this. You better start doing things to make God happy so he can stop hurting you. And Job would say, no, that's not, I trust in the Lord, I trust in the Lord. But then there's this moment where Job starts lashing out towards God saying, why are you doing this to me? This is horrible. I thought I was your child. I have been faithful. I have been, right? And he's just saying almost the same things that his friends are saying. In the book of Job, Job's friends are called cursed. Jonah is called blessed. Why? Jonah wrestled with God was authentic and honest with God, but he never stopped believing he was God. Jonah, same thing. Jonah just was, oh, I don't want to go to Nineveh. All right, I'll go to Nineveh. Ugh. Really bad attitude. I don't want to go to Nineveh because you're going to save them. Yep, I don't want to do it. Do it. Okay, I'll do it. Darn it, you saved them. Like, <laughs> but he did it. Jacob wrestled with God. All these stories, what makes them different? Not that they weren't sinful people, but they believed that God loved them and was with them and was a forgiving, loving God. They didn't put a facade on God in some religious context. Now, before we go, oh yeah, those are Old Testament, those are, we are the same. We do the same thing on a, on a micro level, on a macro level, we do the same thing in our relationships. We do it with our spouses. We do the same thing. We put on these facades. In our church, church has been guilty of this on so many levels because there's this temptation of an ideology of how you ought to be. And everyone has a Bible and everyone reads it and says Christians ought to be this. And so when you come to church, you're like, okay, well, now we all ought to follow this book. And then you start treating people through these veils, these filters of what they ought to be, instead of just coming as you are, 